Hello and welcome to Trash Arts Tick, Season 2, Episode 7, with myself Ryan, we got Sam, and we got Jackson. And um, please, as ever guys, leave a like, subscribe as well if you enjoy our content for more videos, and uh, please leave a comment. So, this week guys, Sam's going to bring us up to speed with everything industry, I think there's quite a bit that you've got to go over there, um, and then, as part of our monthly well, our month of horror, we're going to actually be discussing the Halloween franchise and what are the good bits within it, what are the bad bits, and what do we think that works that makes it such a, a long-lasting franchise. So, without further ado, over to you, Sam, for industry. There's quite an exciting film being built up at the moment. It's uh, Adam McKay's new film, the guy who did Big Short and Vice, and of course Anchorman and so many other good comedies. It's called Don't Look Up, and uh, Netflix are uh, making it. I think I mentioned it before that we had uh, Kate Blanchett was cast as the lead actress alongside Jennifer Lawrence. Well, the cast just got more stacked. We have Leonardo DiCaprio is now in it. Timothy, I can never pronounce this guy's name, but Chamele or Camele, however he pronounces it. Jonah Hill, Meryl Streep. It's just stacked. The cast, there's more names. I just kept looking and going, all right, they're going to have to Google the rest of those names. But it, it's, it's supposedly he wants to go to more of a... Um, a purer like satire he i think what i read is that mckay after vice felt so bleak <laughs> and felt it was the most bleakest thing he did he just wanted to have something that was a bit more fun but still satirically you know stabbing something and the film's about um there's a meteorite coming and scientists have to go around trying to convince civilization or at least america that uh yeah there's a meteorite coming and we need to believe it so it sounds kind of cool it's, it sounds like it's perfect for the sort of stuff he does and if he can get it behind camera and stuff, it could be out in time for the 2022 Oscars. We'll see. Ava Derdene, who um, did the 13th, Selma, uh, When They See Us, a lot of great Netflix stuff. She's actually got a new film with Netflix called Cast Aid. It's about the unwritten cast aid system that has contributed to the division of America. And if anyone's seen any of Ava's other works, such as 13th or Selma, she... She's just very powerfully confident with what the fuck she's talking about. And it's always looking at social injustice. And she's, yeah, I'm, I'm quite excited for this film. She's only done the good stuff with Netflix. And again, two stories of pro-Netflix. So, there you go. Furiosa, the, the uh, prequel to the character from Mad Max, Fury Road. They've, uh, we said before, they have confirmed casting that in the prequel... Anya Taylor-Joy from The Witch will be the lead role. But they've also recently, because it's definitely happening and George Miller's definitely doing it, Chris Hemsworth's now in it, which uh, you kind of see it fits. And yeah. because George Miller's a good director, maybe you can get some good Chris Hemsworth, you know, and not just phoning it in, Hemsworth. And um, Yahala Abdul-Martin II, who recently played Watchmen and was to be, um, well, he was Mr. Metropolis in Watchmen, and he was to be in the new Candyman film. He's also been casting it. So it's building. It's going to happen. When we'll see it, who knows? It took years. George Miller directing this one as well. Yeah. He he's, just, uh, he's old. That's going to be a hard <laughs> job for him. Like, surely, at that, that age. Because he insists on shooting on location. He does. I think the thing to consider, though, is he had the choice. He could have continued Mad Max story or do this story. And he clearly really wants to tell this story. Yeah. I mean... Fair enough if he's if he's capable. I, I'm not sure I could survive a Mad Max set. So you know, <laughs> he, good on him. <laughs> and finally, the classic, legendary UK film distribution company Vipco Films, who you might remember, we did a black case with some skulls and a warning and some over the top title. Usually found them in shops next to the porn, the old VHS back in the day. But I'm much younger than what that sounded like. <laughs> <laughs> but as a good friends of ours, uh, Peter Hopkins from Horror Screen Vaults and Lorne Child have decided to resurrect it. And they're currently looking for new content. So we're going to put a link underneath for you to check that out. Um, I think it's awesome that it's come back. There aren't many UK um, physical distribution, especially on the small level of horror. We just don't have things like trauma or anything like that. So to have something that wants to help the, the so many emerging independent horror films as well. It's cool. It's all good news. <laughs> Cinemas are collapsing and, you know, like, they're going to be 
probably gone next year. Why did you do that? <laughs> but it's all good, good news. news. But, you present, know, some, present some good news, shoot it in the head. <laughs> <laughs> so on that bombshell, I was going to add something to that, actually. It's that, um, what I find really fascinating is, um, for our American viewers that maybe don't know, um, our government has basically changed and introduced a tier system for like local lockdown areas. Um, and depending on the tier that you come under, then the more severe the lockdown is for that area. And uh, Liverpool in the UK is one of the places that is, it's high, so it's tier three. Um, and Batman is still filming. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's crazy, isn't it? Well, that's what's work, work area, I guess. Yeah, they've, they've sort of let everyone get on with it, haven't they, in work, it's crazy. Yeah, no, no one's come and tried to shut it down, which I find is, is quite fascinating, but I suppose whenever you're a big production company like that, you can pay them off. <laughs> so, so um, guys, this week we decided, uh, as part of the month of horror, we wanted to discuss Halloween and uh, the Halloween franchise. And um, what, what makes it great and what makes it um, unique as a horror franchise, but also what doesn't work within it and what do we personally like that makes it good or equally bad so one of the things that I, I find quite fascinating about this just doing like a little bit of research I know there's tons of films but in total if you take every single one of the Halloween films and um, there's 11 yeah. and that's not including Halloween Kills which is due out next year so that'll be the 12th installment mm. so in total we're going to have 13 Halloween films by the time you know, the last Halloween comes out, which I think is crazy. And yeah. if you look at the different iterations of it, it just fascinates me. And I think one of the points that I wanted to talk about was um, in terms of the ratings and how you can slowly see this decline in the ratings until you get to Rob Zombie's ones and then it picks back up. And then again, it picks back up again um, with the most recent one. But what do you guys think? I think when it comes to the ratings, because um, in particular, like when you're talking four, five, and six, the murky years, <laughs> those particular years, the films were going more towards VHS. They weren't getting cinema releases. So when H2O came up, I think they wanted that opportunity to make it back to being like, oh, this is a Hollywood film. This isn't an independent film because they've been the smaller studios who've taken over the Halloween franchise. And a lot of Halloween, like, like Jason, like we discussed before, it gets cut to fuck. So the censors cut it to a point where they go, all right, we'll go with that certification. And it's, people complain like crazy. Especially with Halloween 6. Apparently there's a lot missing from Halloween 6 because the censors cut it up. Mm. Oh, well, I noticed that with Halloween 5 as well. I think whenever you get to number 4, that was the reintroduction of Michael Myers, wasn't it? Yeah. Because John Carpenter originally wanted to end it on 2 and then the Halloween franchise would kind of be its own unique different individual mm. stories from thereafter but because there was so much backlash that there was no Michael Myers and he was quite a popular like horror figure they reintroduced him in four and I appreciate that it was like for more of a VHS audience but you can just see that the stories decline like they're really inconsistent and incoherent mm. and especially number five like I know you're talking about number six but I just find number five was just all of a sudden and we discussed this the other day Sam at the time, it was 1989, and no, a lot of other films were kind of introduced in like spiritual stuff or psychics. Yeah, yeah. psychics and stuff. And out of nowhere, the the main character Jamie, and um, the nine year old, it's now psychic and has this weird link to Michael Myers, and it's never explained. And and then in terms of the story that they kind of try to portray, it's she doesn't want to give Michael up. But then at the same time, she doesn't want to be killed by him, but wants to save him. And and then just out of nowhere, that switches. And it's just, what? It's like, I don't know, maybe it's me being a filmmaker. And, and you want everything to be coherent. You want it to follow a, a process and a structure. Yeah, I think I think they that, that that's like a problem with the way that this... All the good Halloween films are always uh, sort of based on, on the... On the basics of the slasher, you know, they're not they're not overly you know overly like trying to reach out to do other things. They're just they are just the slasher films, 
uh, Michael Myers is is a is a real person, and you know, there's nothing sort of supernatural about it. I mean, there is and there isn't. You know, there's, a, there's you know, he gets shot quite a few times and stuff, but um, <laughs> but, but that's never that, really established until like the end of the second one. Oh, is it not? No, the first one, he's still kind of a man. He does get shot, and he does that whole disappearing act and everything. Mm. But it's never really confirmed that he's supernatural. Yeah, as I it suppose, yeah. as it starts to go on, that's whenever it becomes a little bit more like, oh, he's getting blown up and stuff, and <laughs> oh, he just walked out and he's on fire. Like, okay, cool. <laughs> but that's that's the thing. All, all of the good Halloween films seem to have focused in on on those characters and either the relationships between those characters or putting, um, you know, a, a Michael Myers into a slightly different location, like in the second one where it's in the hospital and he's going through it. You know, those those ideas kind of work with slashes. When you start throwing in psychics and stuff, it well, just... It's, it's, a, it's a weird one, because you have to think about times. So those films came out in the late 80s. This is just after Freddy. And you've got that increase of supernatural slashes, like uh, like Child's Play and stuff like that. Mm. So really, it's, it's the studios desperately holding on to what they think will spice up their old slasher series that by that point, you know, it would be 11 years old that franchise would be, which is quite old for an audience that they're mostly aiming towards teenagers back then because they didn't have so much physical media to, you know, get like now where it's, you can get nostalgia of the older audience remembering it. It had to be a teenage audience. So they threw all that stuff in and it made the films worse. That's why when we go back to the first film, it is, like you said, it is a basic slasher story. The producer wanted a film about a, a crazy person who kills babysitters. That's the basic premise. Yeah. And then Deborah Hill and John Carpenter sat down and took it into a more, I don't know, more like primal evil kind of situation, you know? And um, I think that's what John Carpenter always said about Michael Myers, is that he wasn't supernatural. He was just some sort of form of evil, but human still. And then you get that from, like, the first film instantly. I think, like you say... With the first film, what makes it so unique and is a, an all-time classic, in my opinion, is that it keeps everything simple mm. and it keeps the narrative moving with that simplistic sort of view. Whenever you get to the latter ones, like 4, 5, and 6, they start to add too much more layers yeah. onto it. And what it does is it starts to take away from everything that was already pre-established. Yeah, I think it's because they feel like they've got to try and make almost the same film again to try to appeal to the to the fans again. Mm. Um, but they, they don't want to just tell the same story, so they go, I'll oh, chuck this in, or chuck that in, and, and that's how it seems to get like watered down. And and, um, and that's what I think the, the uh, most recent Halloween brought it, brought it so well back to, because it, it just focused back in on those characters and on what was going on in their lives. Um, and and that sort of gave it, I don't know, that more grounded sort of feeling that, that allowed you to empathise with those characters. What it did do, so correct me if I'm wrong on this, Sam, but effectively the most recent one, the 2018 version, is technically a sequel to the 1978 yeah. one. Spirited sequel, as they call yeah. it. Yeah, so it's not I, technically, but... I think it's... It, it's it, there is that truth, but the, the new one has still got a lot of things that aren't necessary in it. If you look at what makes the first Halloween work so well, structurally, your characters. You've got Laurie Strode, you've got Michael Myers, you've got crazy old Loomis. Good old Loomis. And then you've got victims. Everything else is, that's it. That's it, right? Yeah. And that's so simple. It's such a simple structure. And they made icons of those characters because they hadn't really, you know, there hadn't really been films like that. They've been slashers. But something so suburban and so like, yeah, just simple by going there's a serial killer killing people on Halloween. It's yeah. a very, very simple concept. And all of the Halloween films after it couldn't, you know, they always added extra stuff. And even in the 2018 one, there's a lot of characters. There's a lot of backstories to characters. Even Doctor, his new Dr. Loomis was obviously... Um, Donald Pleasance died a long time ago. 95. Yeah, at least they didn't try to do some virtual Loomis stuff. That would have been weird. <laughs> yeah. Strange. And that's the thing. You, after that point, you've got those four characters. or um, Sorry, three characters, those three ones. You've got Loomis, Michael Myers, and Strode. They're continuing timeline, storyline-wise. Because obviously with Laurie, she, she comes back several times. She dies at one point, And of course, she gets her proper like storyline that's happening right now. Loomis just stuck with it. Kept on going and eventually Donald Pleasance died so he had to stop going. 
And of course, Michael Myers was always consistent, but the third one. But it's those base characters that when they've been there like continuously from the beginning, you have your expectations of what it should be. Mm. And when those middle films don't have those characters, just have Michael Myers. And they've got Loomis, but by that point you're like, why has Loomis not got anything else going on in his life? <laughs> He's a little bit obsessed. Is he crazier than Michael Myers? I was going to ask you yeah. guys what um, your opinion was on Loomis. He's crazy. <laughs> He's obsessed. He's supposed to be a doctor. And like you said, I don't know how many doctors run around with guns like he does. <laughs> so, uh, uh, maybe this is just me being pernickety, but I remember uh, watching four. Well, I think one, two and four and he's he's always got like uh you know a revolver yeah but he's always walking out and holding it with his right hand and for some strange reason he's left-handed in the f fifth one like he's just running around with like a, a different type of handgun but with loomis one of the things that struck me is like you say he's crazy yeah there was one scene in particular in the fifth one where jamie just isn't giving michael myers up and loomis just for un well, a reason that isn't given, knows that she knows something because she's having like these fits. So he he just assumes that, oh, well, she's having fits because she's linked to Michael. And that progresses the story. And then he just comes barging into a room at one stage. He's like screaming. He's pushing this trolley out of the way. Like, it's like, that's a nine-year-old kid. <laughs> and you're barking at her. It's like... It's been then different the, times, man. I know, but <laughs> it, it's the. I think we discussed it again a few weeks ago. But with horror franchises in particular, certain characters, if the actor's comfortable in that role and is a fan favorite, they'll just keep turning up in all the films. Yeah. Even if you're like, you should move on, move on with your life, <laughs> do something else. You so go be a doctor. Go do what you've started. But it's. Um, but it is, yeah, it's interesting how, like, with him, they tried to do something. They tried to twist it a little bit with old, um, I can't remember what the Doctor's called in the 2018 one. But he's like Loomis, but he's more the reality of what Loomis actually is. Insane. Is it not still Loomis? Is it? I think so. I, I don't think it is. Wow. I heard a, a theory that, um, I think I heard it, that, that Loomis was like, uh, that, that he was like a... Uh, essentially releasing Michael Myers each time and, and that he was like behind it essentially um, that's people trying to make logic out of yeah out of the <laughs> madness of the of the yeah. later films yeah yeah I can't remember the depiction of Dr. Loomis in um, Rob Zombie's Halloween but I think from what I remember because he's he obviously has been working with him since he was six years old because in what, what Halloween does with Rob Zombie's one is he does look at the mental health side of it just a little bit more and kind of actually builds that relationship with Loomis beyond fearful old man that this guy's going to kill everyone. He spent that time with him at least. Even though I can't remember the depiction of Loomis and it could be like completely different from what's <laughs> in my mind. Rob Zombie's one at least tries to get you a bit more of an understanding of who Michael Myers is. But he yeah. does it in his... Um, Unique. His trash <laughs> man. His trash man. He loves that kind of stuff. Yeah. But that's why I really did appreciate it. Even though it made the Halloween film, what, like two hours long, which felt very long for a Halloween film. Yeah. Longer than anything the Carpenter did or any of the sequels. But I think he... He really did want you to understand who Michael Myers is. He knows who everyone's favourite character is. They know it's Michael Myers. And... Yeah, I think for a lot of people that kind of pissed them off because with the original, the dark mystery is we don't know who Michael Myers is. Mm -hmm. He's just a kid who lost it and now is going to try and kill um, Laurie Strode and all their friends and everyone. Whereas Rob Zombie's like, you know who Michael Myers is. Let's get a bit deeper and see who my Michael Myers is. Yeah, yeah. There's a whole backstory, isn't there? Yeah, this is like the first half of the film's the backstory before yeah. he even gets into the... Yeah, I feel like... Um... You know, once once you've built up that kind of reputation of those films, though, it's quite easy to you know take that and and to to go to that extent. I think that's what the original Halloween uh, it benefited from not doing that because it it allowed that sort of uh, that the character of Michael Myers to kind of be that anyone. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and it's a lot more scary to think of Halloween with you know all these people walking around with masks on. Um, and this, this bloke with a Shatner mask on going around killing people. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the things that's really interesting for me is I, I, I love Halloween and I, like even 
the crappier ones that are rated worse. I still think that they're good in their own right because you've got an iconic character who's just brilliant, but you can see how each individual director has brought their own kind of style to it. So with the first two, it's John Carpenter, isn't it? Um, so a unique style that John Carpenter brings, and it's really, really cool. You can follow it, it's coherent. Then when you get to the fourth one, you, you feel like that director wanted to take the franchise in his own way or like his own direction. Mm. But then by the time you get to the fifth one, it's a completely new director who, again, steers it in a completely different direction. There's that mysterious ending where the random bloke who's just been walking around that you never see his face turns up, attacks the police station and Michael Myers gets released. Well, well, the thing that's how it ends. It's like... The thing with all that kind of stuff is it's not really the director's choice. It's the producer's choice. So um, John Carpenter directs the first one. He didn't direct the second one, but he produced the second one. So it still had that very Halloween vibe to it. By the fourth one, I think it was either a different studio or the producer continued, the other producer continued without John Carpenter, allowing them to go with the story they wanted to tell. They failed. And by the fifth one, they were taken in by other ideas. So again, they, they, those sequels never feel like they're really like auteur pieces from directors. Because they're not given much room of it. That's why I always find that particular period of they the sequels, aren't. they're all kind of dull. <clears throat> they aren't, but you can see, so when you look at the fourth one compared to the fifth one, the kind of way that they do the scares and the way that Michael Myers appears, I find that with the fourth one, you rarely see him. And then when you do see him, you're like, oh, okay. And a bit shocked by it. In the fifth one, he's fucking everywhere. Yeah. Like, and when I think about it, it's like he, he ends up in the attic and he's got all these different bodies there. And I was like, I was thinking about how the hell did he manage to do that? Because they're doing it as if, you know, it's POV from his perspective while he's in this house. It's like, it's the middle of a day and then you've gone and tracked all these other people. When did you get that body that you just murdered back to your house, put it in the attic and then get back to know where these like other characters are? It's just very disjointed. Well, let's, let's again. Be that's where the director they yeah. had their own kind of. Well, it's, it's not new even style. that. It's lazy filmmaking. They get worse in quality because they make less money, and because it's horror, they just have like more borderline independent studios taking over. And with Halloween, when it got to like five, it was sort of down in the dump sort of thing. And then six, uh, Dimension Films took it over. Hence why they went for a whole different thing that nobody liked. The cult. So, yes, they went to H two O. And then Resurrection, which is just a nightmare of a film, they were just like really bad films. They weren't well, they weren't well made. Didn't have great actors, and the scares were routine. At least with the twenty eighteen one, and even Rob Zombie's first one to some degree, there was a creative direction towards them. The other films lacked <clears throat> direction. It was more about we need to keep competition with uh, Jason and Freddy, and yeah. by that point, people got bored of those films because they were losing the same things. Well, you think like so many of those kind of films are cropping up everywhere at that point, um, you know, from the lowest ends to like the highest ends of, uh, you know, like you said, Freddy and, and Jason. Um, and that, that must have been quite difficult to know what to do in order to, to compete in yeah. some ways. Like how, how do you, how do you make it different enough to keep up your, you know, your franchise, but at the same time uh, compete with these other franchises, which Especially are already when... doing a lot of mad things as it is. Yeah, and you were before then, because yeah. obviously that was nineteen seventy eight, and the effect of Halloween, Friday the Thirteenth. Mm. It's the main reason why Friday the Thirteenth exists. They wanted a cash cow, just like Halloween was going to become. Mm. So to be on your yeah, fifth film. And those films around you that are inspired by you are on their like seventh going towards their eighth film. Yeah. Yeah, it's gonna be hard to catch up, I guess. Yeah. So I think one of the things that um so basically throughout different periods of the last thirty odd years. Is it thirty? It'd be forty. Yeah, it's forty, isn't it? <clears throat> so in the last forty two years, there's been different iterations of films, um but also subject to the time and the horror kind of genre where it was going at the time. So, like we were saying, with Five, it's heavily influenced by the psychic kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, with Resurrection, that one to me oh. kind of... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sam doesn't really like Resurrection Jeez. at all. <laughs> uh, ironically enough, it's the lowest rated out of all the Hall uh, Halloween films. 
But with Resurrection, I feel like they were trying to go the same way as what Friday the 13th did with um, A New Nightmare, where it's... That's uh, just Nightmare on Elm Street. With a yeah, new yeah, yeah. Nightmare on Elm Street, with um, A New Nightmare. So you know where they kind of... Wes Craven did it brilliantly, but he tried to do this a couple of times, I, think, I believe, where he takes it out and it's like, it's the actors playing themselves. Yeah. Or the people, yeah, playing themselves. Resurrection, to me, felt a bit like that. In the way that it was, oh, it's a reality TV show that's going and staying in the Michael Myers house. And well, this is the funny thing. If I think about those those two films, H two O and Resurrection, yeah, they're both too late. So H two O is too stylized to try and be like the old ones from the eighties. Yeah. And um, Resurrection is trying to be meta, like Scream, and um, Urban Legend, and I know what you did last summer, but it's two thousand and two. Yeah, and they're trying to do reality TV with the Big Brother stuff and trying to be all self-aware and it's like you're too late Halloween you're just too late this is just lame and embarrassing and that's that's why I always feel that franchise lacked is it always felt like it was too late to do that and that's what was so cool about 2018 when it was like wow we haven't seen this yet and it works and it was Halloween that did it first so do you guys have like a, a favourite Halloween moment throughout any of the 11 films I just, to me personally, I always think about my first experience watching Halloween and being scared by music because I was quite young and I remember the scene where I think she's just walking home and the camera's just watching her walking and it's going past cars and it's so full of dread that you're just like, what the hell is going to happen to her? You just felt like evil was watching her at all times and that's why I feel like the first Halloween succeeds in so much is that sense of dread is just everywhere there's something dark and it's heading towards her and we don't really know it but it wants to kill her yeah i think it, uh, for me it it's that opening scene of the first film that's just so it just takes you entirely because because when you haven't seen it before the first time of watching you don't really realize what's going on no. until that sort of moment when it puts when he puts the mask on. It seems just like a roaming shot almost. Then he puts a mask on, and you suddenly see through the eyes, and you're like, "Oh, I'm from a POV here." Mm. And then you see the knife, and then you see the stat, and it's just like, "Whoa!" It just it, it totally throws you from what you're from what you sort of expect to see at the beginning of a film. It, it takes you totally unaware and puts you on the edge of your seat for the rest yeah, of the yeah. film because. I'd no, I'd not seen anything like that before that. So you know that was um, that's always the moment that sort of really, uh, really defines the films for me, and and that's what I enjoyed seeing in, in the, uh, in the Rob uh, Rob Zombie one, and in the um, uh, in the twenty eighteen one is there was a lot of those roaming shots. There wasn't any POVs in like the same. No. Well, there might have been, but I, I can't remember now. Um, but not so powerful POVs if there were any. Um, but there were a lot of roaming shots where you followed it through the, th followed them through the house, or you saw through the windows mm. they're walking through, and and that to me really like, uh, yeah, that 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 made something very very creepy, especially that look through the window. That's something I always want to do in film because of Halloween, I think. See, I think with me, uh, Halloween was the first horror film that I ever watched. And I was probably about maybe six or seven. Um, so I used to stay at my auntie's and she had like loads of horror films and stuff. But it was actually H2O that I saw first. Um, so then I went back and watched Halloween. Um, but I just, again, I love the tracking shots. But I think one thing that always got me is something that's not in your peripheral. So, you know, you're sitting watching a standard scene and then all of a sudden there's just something comes into shot. And then it just cuts away, or the, the you know the angle moves on, or the tracking shot moves on. There's that great one in the first film at the end of the film, yeah, where he just gets up, but he just in the background doesn't he? he just sits up, and you're like, whoa, shit! Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Reminds me of the Undertaker from wrestling or something. It's just like, um, but yeah, that just absolutely blew my mind. And also, probably not like a a favorite moment, but one of my favorite consistencies throughout all of the films. Um, I'm not sure so much about Rob Zombies, but the John Carpenter score, the Halloween theme, and I love how they revamped it and kind of yeah, like yeah, that that bit of music was so is so just it just it just immediately conjures up dread, doesn't yeah. it? And and something I mean we 
<laughs> whenever you're driving around, Brian, and you've got the Halloween score on, it doesn't matter where we are, it could be the sunniest day, and I'm still feeling nervous sitting there like, is there someone in the, someone in the crowd, someone in the traffic? <laughs> I think it, it works because of the way that the beats roll. Yeah. And because a lot of the, um, whether it be from POV or, you know, even the most recent Halloween film, you know, it's like a behind shot and there's tons of tracking shots. So it's beat for beat in the walk. And it's like, you're waiting for that anticipation. Like what is going to happen? And like that dread, like you said. Yeah. I think it's, it's something cool in the music where it's like, it, it, it's fast paced and yet underneath it, it's slow paced at mm. the same time. So you, you know, you've got that. The guitar. Dun, that, yeah. That's the slow bit. And then obviously the, you know, I'm not going to try and do the, yeah, you can, you can do an impression. Yeah. <laughs> the rest of the podcast just me singing the Halloween theme. <laughs> <laughs> but that those two things, uh, we there was something something we watched the other day as well. Um, but though the fast paced and the slow paced um, music together, it just sets you on edge. There's something yeah, yeah. about it that really sort of like gets you uncomfortable because you don't know whether to go or not. Yeah, it's kind yeah. of oh, oh. it gets the heart racing. Yeah, <laughs> especially because obviously the first time you hear the score is when the, the pumpkin's just there, and it's just credits. You're yeah. watching that pumpkin, and you're like, "What's going on?" It's such a simple <laughs> technique. Yeah, yeah, and they use it quite effectively in most of the films. So I really like the second one where the pumpkin opens up and it's the skull inside, and you kind of zoom into it. Yeah, we I need mean, to talk about the film that we haven't mentioned. I know it's the ugly duckling of the Halloween films, which a lot of people love. I think some people, I, I swear Tom Lee Rutter would say it's his probably favourite Halloween, but Halloween 3. Gotta talk about the absurdity and the weirdness that is Halloween 3. A film that feels very out of place and feels like a feverish dream that you think, you, you know, that real. But it's still a lot of fun. It's still a good <laughs> film. It's just because Odd Carpenter wanted to go in that different direction. It actually has a really great score from what I remember. But it is such a strange film. And it, it, it's what makes Halloween unique that they took that chance, even if it didn't work. And it was weird and odd. But it, do you remember the story with the masks and there's the shamrock and... I Island vaguely and remember. Was there a bus Sandhain. crash or something in it? There's a bus crash in a lot of them. But yeah. I don't know. It's about an investigation. Like um, his son's watching these adverts, the shamrock song. It's really the most one of those annoying Halloween songs. And it's leading up to Halloween and he starts doing an investigation into the masks and then finds out the masks are related to some ritualistic stuff to do with Samhain and Halloween and all that. And they're going to kill all the kids or turn them into the masks. I can't remember. It's such a confusing, strange film that you just kind of go, I guess that's if that's where you want to take the franchise. And it may have effectively killed where the fourth and fifth could go because they went so crazy with it. That the fourth, fifth, by like going back to Michael Myers, like, hey, you guys, Michael Myers, like, you enjoy him. It's like... You almost accept defeat on the new direction. Yeah. They should have just pushed ahead after that. They should, they should have. should have gone for the anthology thing. And, you know, we could have had the nice remakes of, you know, the Michael Myers stuff later on. But then I would argue if that had happened, there wouldn't be such a lure around Maybe Michael not, Myers and I Halloween. Think, I think those first two films are what really captivated people to that character um, I, I don't know because again time wise we're talking 1978 and then because Halloween 4 and 5 have quite a big fan base because it's like 88, 87 so it's those you know, 88, 89 those kids who are getting prime time full on slashes and more access to them than they would have had to the original Halloween so I don't know I feel like that it's been around for so long that you will just get certain age groups or certain audiences where you go that's my Halloween yeah. And that's why people have problems with the new ones mm. and why they would not even listen to Rob Zombie going towards Halloween. <laughs> you know, it's, it's always people just going to be set in their ways and it's okay. The franchise has been around long enough. Yeah. We don't get pissed off when people have certain bonds. So why not be like, all right, you like that Halloween stage because you like that particular character, you know, or you like that particular version of Michael Myers. I mean, they're, they're fundamentally wrong when it comes to creating you know, <laughs> the terrible films, but you can understand why for them, that's the story they remember. The other ones would, might have even felt a bit tame in comparison because they didn't feel like they were of that time. I think as well, I, I think that horror is probably the only genre that you can actually forgive for making a bad film and you can still have an appreciation and a love for it because it is a horror film. You're still going to get your jump scares. You're still going to get 
you know. Well, I think also like most horror films, uh, the the characters that you've been following, the majority of them will be dead by the end. Yeah, of yeah. It. And so you know, you, you never know, get invested. Exactly. In you you know that they're like, oh, if this is a bad film, all of those characters will die, and we'll we'll start with some. Let's new just characters see how how can... unique their killings are. Yeah. Because <laughs> as the films go on, the killings become more and more. Unique yeah, and extravagant. characters get flatter and more 2D stereotypes, but the killings get more creative. And is the weird thing, who won in the creative war there? The makeup designers. They're the guys yeah. who won. Because they get to do some amazing effects. And, yeah. and by that point, you're like, I'm in it for that. I know who Michael Myers is. I don't care about who the victims are. Let's just go in for the kills. But it's nice to have a measure of both. You know, That's what made the first one so good. I guess where they tried to rein it back in was H2O yeah. a little bit and bringing back Laurie Strode. And this is one of the things that I fundamentally have a problem with with Halloween is that the inconsistency of stories and yeah. storylines. Because by four, Laurie Strode's meant to be dead, died in a car accident, and we follow her daughter, Jamie. But then by H2O, actually, scratch that, what she'd done is faked her like death and she just left her daughter there and went off and started a new life and had another kid um, and now she's called Carrie something it's the old Hollywood trick that if something's terrible you just go that never happened yeah. <laughs> we're going to re rewrite that so the fans go yay we won no one's going to remember do? that that was 10 years ago they've done yeah. it for it like they do it with soaps all the time you yeah. know it's, it's, it's a typical thing that they're, that yeah, they're but not doing whenever it's... When, when something's extended over a period of time and they go oh shit we, we've run out of things to write about let's just let's bring this character back you know? they didn't also, die in that explosion it, <laughs> it's the anniversary wasn't it that's why it was called H2O because it was 20 year anniversary of the original Halloween so they wanted to hark back basically they were almost doing a spiritual sequel to the first one in 1998 you could tell that, that was their plan but they also realised they couldn't do that because nobody I don't know, nobody would understand that at that time there's not enough time to see how where the franchise could go you know, and to build that horror fandom you truly get nowadays so I don't know, it's, it's kind of cool but then they also did that whole next generation thing which horror films always tend to try to go towards to keep it going and they went with Josh Hartnett. Because that's the son, isn't it? We know He's... how you feel about Josh. <laughs> oh, no. Terrible haircuts. Some of the worst haircuts in horror Man, movies. It was, in the it 90s. was 90s. <laughs> always a little bit up here, and you're like, you're supposed to be the cool guy. What's the curtains? Who decided this? Have you actually rated all the haircuts of horror films <laughs> in the 80s? Because I think that's... there's some crazy, crazy yeah, you, haircuts. That's the next in... section. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we'll do a podcast on it. <laughs> yeah, you have to remember, when I got into horror, would have been like 99, 2000. So yeah. obviously, VHS is took a lot about a year or so to come out rather than like immediately so all i was watching was that whole new brand of the late 90s horror films and they all had terrible haircuts sure but josh hartness bit was always up here and i and, and same as you h2o was the first halloween i saw because it probably came out around that time my friend just got it and he really liked um, well his his brother liked michael myers so he liked michael myers yeah and um yeah it's just I think in H2O... It's just boring. It's, well, no, I think in terms of story, it, it, the narrative is a bit off, but I like She's some of the jumps. Yeah. Yeah. That came completely left field for me, but um, I think the, some of the scares, and I remember they're in the hallway and he's in the outside and the windows are smashing or something. And that just stands out. It's like, oh, this is, this is cool. This is scary. And I'm only seven, so... <laughs> but that, that's it. I mean, I can understand from that perspective, especially if it's the first time you see, you see a Halloween film, you get to go, oh, oh that's the thing that, that um, I've seen images of and all people spoke about. Maybe not as you as a seven-year-old, but those yeah. who haven't seen Halloween, they saw that's the first thing, they go, oh, okay, that's what that's about. But, but it's, it's never the same as being the, the, the original. And when it came to H2O... They softened loads of things. They just softened the character and stuff. Whereas at least with the, the 2018 one, they made her a badass survivor. Yeah. You know, she, she was capable to look after herself, but she knew that this thing was more evil. So she had to be even more trained up. And that's great, because in H2O, she's just a university professor, isn't she? Yeah. She has in to run California? away a couple of times. Does she have to save her son? Yeah, basically, <sighs> yeah, there's a whole... Does the son's just girlfriend not get killed or something as well? And Who knows? They all, it's just... I can't remember exactly. But I, I know Resurrection. Like, the, oh, even though Resurrection is... The beginning of that one as well. Why I thought that was quite cool what they did. Only because Laurie Strode is... Well, 
if, if you've gone and watched H2O, and then for me, I went and watched Halloween, and then Halloween 2, Laurie Strode is like the main player. She's mm. the one that survives and everything. Regardless if you like her character or not, you're not expecting right at the start of Re- Resurrection for her to get killed. Yeah, but it's such... So, whoa, okay. The way Where's they this keep, going? The way they kill is terrible. She's in a mental institution, which just like... Yeah, I get it. She's had a terrible time, but it shows that all that she's accepted is chaos from it. And then they kill her off in the first, like, f- ten minutes. She seems to... It's disrespectful to the character, if anything. Probably, from but, as, again... Kurtz she seems to die chance. more than, like, just as much as Michael Myers, to be honest. Like, I was 12. <laughs> I was 12 when that came out, and that yeah. hit home really quickly. And I was like, oh, Jesus. I haven't watched it since then, but I know it's just not a great film. Yeah. Ludicrous. Is it Ludicrous? Nice. No, it's, what's Busta it? Rhymes, yeah. Kung Fu, one of the worst things you could ever see. <laughs> Jesus. I'd love to be one of the guys in that boardroom who were writing this and just, yeah, we'll have Busta Rhymes, Kung Fu kick him. It's like, what? It's either that or he just improvised it and they went, yeah, keep that in. That, that, that makes sense. Fans will love that. Yeah. Busta! Busta! <laughs> the thing is, like, that's what pisses me off about the Halloween fans, like most fans. They, they've com- they're the ones who complain about a recent one. And they'll complain about it for different elements. Some elements because they're just anti-women. And it's quite a feminist story to some degree. Um, and the other side is that they just go, well, they've ignored those films. Or, ah, oh, that wasn't that was too safe. Or, ah, oh, this is just playing off troops that Bloomhouse always does and blah, blah, blah. It's all very stupid and pointless. Because mm. the fact is, it's a good film. It's come from creators who went to John Carpenter and showed the respect. And went, what do you think of the script? That's why John Carpenter produced it. If anything, it is the closest we're going to get to a spiritual sequel. And it just, the feeling you get in that film is just thrills. It's it, the first one John Carpenter was involved with as well. Yeah. Like, since the third one. Because for one, I imagine the others probably didn't get want to get John Carpenter involved. Because they just wanted to put the Halloween franchise in their direction. As opposed to creatively what he wanted to do. What we've seen from, but from the third one. So at least with the new Halloween, we get an appreciation of the film... It made fuck tons of money, which re-encouraged a, a visit back to horror where we can go, okay, let's do these spiritual, spiritual sequels. We go back to why we loved the first film and we try and improve, you know, make a decent quality sequel. Candyman's gone with it. We're seeing it from Scream. We're seeing it from so many more films. And some people go, oh, they've run out of ideas. Like, or are they just respecting the original material? Yeah, and, I, and that's and that's exciting. And Halloween a, started that. In a way, yeah. that means Halloween is, is going to sort of it seems to be sparking off once again another the set of films slasher that renaissance. come from it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's quite mad. Slash renaissance. That's what, that's what happened with the original film. Is it, yeah. It, it, uh, yeah. I, I don't think... Slasher renaissance. Enough people don't seem to respect that fact. So these things that they've loved all their lives, this made a lot of money and it got like people actually went, this is good. And then they're like, oh no, it's not like how I was like, you're getting more of it now. You haven't had this for years. Yeah. Why can't we just be happy that this is a franchise that's you know actually in a strong position as opposed to weekly just re- reduced to releasing constant films that are crap? I think there's a there's a thing like you know we talk about toxic fandom quite a lot yeah. um, really, but there is a thing where where people just want to disapprove of it in some way because it doesn't live up to the one that they watched when they were younger and happier yeah. or whatever um, and, and they don't seem to realise that that nostalgia effect is, is just that and actually this this new film did quite a lot of the, you know, in terms of the, the um, uh, feminist sort of perspective on it um, you know, the original film was that, it did have mm. that female empowerment uh, thing to it just for the time, which was the 70s you know, so it wasn't exactly as empowering as, as <laughs> films are now. Even after falling in love with Halloween, um, like originally when I was seven, and coming up to even after the Rob Zombie stuff, I don't know about you guys, but whenever I heard about the new Halloween coming out, I was pumped. Yeah. yeah. Like, it like reinvigorated my love for the franchise. I was like, oh, do you know what? I'm going to go back and watch the original again so I can get prepped for the new one. It's, 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 it's being excited to see what creative direction it goes in. And if the right elements are there, then why shouldn't you be excited? Why oh, shouldn't yeah. you be happy that... For, you and know, when you see those names attached to it as yeah. well, they, they, that, that excited me. Mm. Um, just, yeah. That's why for the next two films, it's looking good. The franchise is looking like it's in a good direction, right? It's a shame that it couldn't come out this year. Yeah, but right. you don't want it in March, do you? No well, no, wants... I mean, like, yeah, I know, obviously, yeah. given the current situation, but that would have been so awesome because we'd be talking about 
that film right now as well. Well, yeah. we're still talking about it. Yeah, but, just yeah, but we, don't know, for we don't know yeah. the narrative. <laughs> Halloween Kills, coming October 2021. And then potentially the rumour, of course, that Halloween Ends comes out two weeks later. Really? Yeah, yeah they yeah, shot them back to back. So oh. they're potentially talking about releasing them quite close. The original date for Halloween Ends was meant to be next October, but now because this one's pushed, they might release them they in two weeks. They haven't changed the date of that film. They've just put the other one into it. It's like, oh, are they going to... Well, yeah. yeah, we'll see. That would be a nice end to, you know, pandemic season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So just to finalise, guys, if you could pick one of the Halloween films to be your favourite Halloween film, what would it be? And a brief why. I kind of feel like we're all going to agree. Yeah, I but think so as well, but... The classic, the original, John Carpenter's. It's always going to be Carpenter's. It's got... All of his like <clears throat> authorship coming into play. It's the first time he decides to do things with Steadicam. It's excellent writing from him and Deborah Hill. You've got an iconic um, final girl as well as an iconic killer and an iconic psychic character with Dr. Loomis. The most perfect score. Genuinely scary. Great victim kills, like the whole bit with the whole um, sheet, the ghost sheet kind of thing. Oh, yeah. It's just a near enough perfect horror film. And there's hardly any films that can match it. For like doing everything it's supposed to do. I, uh, I mean, I agree with you, Sam. But <laughs> oh, at the same oh. time, um, I, I think that um, I actually, for the enjoyment of seeing it, and maybe because I got to see it in the cinema as well. Um, the the latest one, I really really enjoyed it. I thought it was. I, I just felt like it did take it back to the quality of the original, but in a, in a modern context. And um, I know there were elements that weren't perfect. I'm not saying it's it's the best Halloween film, but I really I really enjoyed it. Very, you know, I thought it was just 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 powerful, and I felt like the relationships were very real, and the um, the way that everything sort of came across, and the way that the way that Michael Myers came back into the the narrative and and uh, the way it sort of the the response the way that the characters were responding to that and the, you know the idea that some of them were blasé and some of them were panicked you know um, Jamie Lee Curtis was uh, obviously incredibly panicked by uh, hearing that he'd escaped again and and seeing that sort of older generation and that that fear of something. Uh, that's real with the with the younger generation kind of being like nah it's not it's not a big deal um it just it, it yeah i think it just spoke to me for the time that we're in at the moment where you've got uh you know <laughs> i'm gonna finish there i'm gonna finish there i'm just i'm just rambling now <laughs> you could do your own podcast <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I, I, I was probably going to be on the fence with this because I really, really love the new one. And it, like I said before, I got pumped whenever I found out that it was going to be coming out. And whenever I watched it, I came away with like real super feels for it. And it brought me that love again of the um, franchise itself. It was like, oh, you know what? I'm going to go back and rewatch everything again. But fundamentally, we can't have the 2018 one without having the original. Yeah, yeah. And the original did so much to, I don't know, just transcend the way that horror can be portrayed. Um, you know, a lot of the POV stuff and um, the tracking shots were amazing. The tension from the music. I just fundamentally think that that was fantastic. And at no given stage in my life, when I've gone back and watched it, and I don't think this will ever change, do I feel like it's outdated? Even though it's made in, what, 1978? Yeah. It never feels old to me. Mm. Yeah. And that'll always stay with me. It's the key with classic horror, isn't it? Those classic horror films, they will... It doesn't matter when they're set. They're always going to scare the shit out of you. Yeah. And that's what horror's supposed to do. So on that note, guys, we hope you enjoyed our Halloween franchise chat. If there's anything you'd like to add, please leave us a comment. As ever, leave us a like and subscribe for more Trash Shirts content coming soon. Other than that, guys, thank you very much and uh, Trash Shirts take out. Bye. Bye.